Bonsoir. Bienvenue tout le monde. Alors, euh, c'est le fun de voir euh, qu'il y a autant de personnes pour la toute première conférence euh, organisée par euh, le nouveau comité de vie scientifique des étudiants de l'INRS. Avant de débuter, j'aimerais remercier M. Yves Bégin, directeur du centre, qui nous a incité à dynamiser euh, la vie étudiante à l'INRS. Et c'est un peu pour cela qu'on a pu faire un événement de, de ce genre-là. Donc, merci beaucoup. Euh, donc, sans plus tarder, notre conférencier d'aujourd'hui, M. Raymond Bradley, est un professeur euh, éminent et directeur du Centre de recherche sur le climat de l'Université du Massachusetts à Amherst. Euh, il étudie les changements climatiques depuis plus de 40 ans et euh, il, il cherche euh, spécifiquement euh, à comprendre comment les changements climatiques se sont produits dans le passé et ce, à différentes échelles temporelles. Donc, M. Bradley a été auteur ou co-auteur de plus de 7, 170 articles et 11 livres portant sur le sujet. Aussi, il a été conseillé auprès de nombreuses agences nationales et internationales, dont la Fondation nationale de la science aux États-Unis, en Suisse, en Suède, au Royaume-Uni. Aussi, il a été conseillé auprès du Consortium américain pour la recherche arctique à l'Agence américaine responsable de l'étude de l'océan et de l'atmosphère pour le groupe intergouvernemental sur l'évolution du climat, ainsi que du programme international Géosphère-Biosphère. Au cours de sa brillante euh, carrière, il a obtenu en 2003 un doctorat en sciences de l'Université de Southampton en Grande-Bretagne pour ses contributions au domaine de la paléoclimatologie. Plus récemment, en 2007, il reçoit la médaille, la médaille Hans Herzger pour ses contributions exceptionnelles, toujours dans l'étude des changements climatiques. Donc, l'INRS est très fier d'accueillir euh, le professeur Raymond Bradley pour euh, sa conférence sur « Global Warming and Political Intimidation ». Merci beaucoup, François. Et je, vous, je vous remercie pour l'invitation à Québec. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi de visiter cette, cette cité et cet uh, institut fantastique. Uh, C'est un grand plaisir d'arriver uh, ici ce soir. Voilà, c'est la fin de mon français pathétique. <laughs> Je vais continuer en anglais. Um, so I'm, I'd like to talk to you this evening about my experience uh, dealing with the political situation um, in the United States specifically. But I think it has uh, some, some resonance certainly for you here in Canada. I know that um, what's happened in Canada is you seem to have set the clock back about 10 years and now are uh, going through the same uh, situation that we experienced in the U.S. Uh, during the Bush era. Um, but let me first of all start off with a little bit of uh, uh, looking f at the science of global warming and then we'll talk about the politics. So let's start off with the, the, a little bit about the science. The Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, which by the way will will produce its next report uh, within a year or so. But this was the conclusion of the last IPCC report. Most of the observed increase in global temperature since the mid 20th century is very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And by very likely, they, they defined it as greater than 90% probability. Of course, if you listen to the weather forecast and somebody says there's a 90% chance of, of snow or rain, you're going to be prepared for that. And so this is a pretty strong statement from the IPCC. If we look at the emissions, or rather the, um, the, the use of uh, 
carbon resources, fossil fuel resources, that have led to the issue of global warming. I just want to look at these two graphs for a second here. This one runs from 1900 to 2000, and this is cumulative emissions from coal, oil, and gas. And then we can see that at the end of the beginning of the last century, most of the emissions were from coal. And um, then these were slowly replaced by oil and eventually by natural gas. And if we go to this graph, here's 1850 to 2000. This is cumulative emissions by region. And you can see that, of course, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which began in, in Great Britain, almost all of the emissions were coming from the UK. And then slowly, Europe became a big participant, and eventually, the United States and Canada and, and other countries. And of course, most recently, we see the increasing role of the, um, the BRIC countries, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China. Uh, but clearly, the bulk of the emissions have been uh, coming from Western Europe and North America. And I'll come back to that point later on. So there's very little argument about the emissions history. We have very good statistics about where these emissions came from and which countries and how much and distribution in different materials. And every major scientific organization has endorsed the conclusions of the IPCC. So there's not much doubt about what's happening to the climate and where the emissions that are responsible for the anthropogenic impacts on the climate are coming from. So the question is, why has the US government, and the Canadian government too, and, and, in, and some other countries of course, but I'm going to speak mostly about the US government, why has the US government not taken action to reduce carbon emissions? And that takes us to the politics of the situation. So here's a little primer on US politics. Because we, we often talk about the left and the right, and in the US context, that would be at the extreme right-hand side, the so-called Tea Party, Tea Party Republicans, and then the Democrats on this axis. Of course, in the US context, there is really no real left wing. Everybody's to the right of center. Even Obama is really what we would think of as sort of right of center. But if we look at it at an international level, of course, we have uh, socialist countries like, like France and Norway, and communist countries like um, China and North Korea at the extreme, and uh, Massachusetts would lie somewhere over in this axis, probably. <laughs> the, the worst thing that you can say, a Republican can say about somebody is to call them a Massachusetts liberal, <laughs> which means they're over in this far somewhere. So the United States is really over, you know, pretty much to the middle, the right of the middle, France and Norway, China on this axis. And then in the political context, the recent context of the elections, we have Obama here, Mitt Romney, who was running against him. And then to the right of Mitt Romney were several other people, uh, perhaps uh, most extreme, Michelle Bachmann from Minnesota, but I'll talk about a couple of others. And everybody in the Republican wing of the party was trying to stay on the right of Romney. And Romney's problem was he had to move to the right in order to capture the initial um, primary to get, to get selected as the candidate. Now on the bottom here, I've got these two other points. On the extreme left, of course, we have a command economy. That would, that would be to say when the government decides something, it, they just decide it. So China decides, well, we're going to dam the Yangtze River. Oh, and there's 10 million people living in the bottom of the river? Well, you have to move. And they build the dam, and indeed, people have to move. At the other end of the spectrum is what George Soros called free market fundamentalism. That is absolutely the opposite. They would like to see absolutely no government controls at all. And in a true free market view, the, the marketplace, the capitalist system, will resolve all of our problems. So if we have pollution, okay. 
People will complain about it, people will come up with solutions, and the market, the free market, will create solutions to whatever the problems are. And so here we have this um, dichotomy, this, this uh, argument that goes on between, especially in the United States, between those who believe in a true capitalist free market system, which by the way does not exist, there is no such thing as a free market system, um, and on the other hand more government controls, and of course the, the, in terms of emissions, trying to control carbon emissions, then the, the balance here is between the government stepping in and introducing a carbon tax or, or a cap and trade system or something like that, versus allowing everybody to just go their own way. And I'll give you a few examples of the, the way this discussion played out during the last presidential uh, election just last year. So here was a candidate, Rick Santorum, and each of these people I'll show you at one point were the leading candidates for the Republican nomination. So these are not, they're not total, they are wackos, but they're not total wackos. <laughs> Global warming is an opportunity for the left, the left wing, to say that we need the government to come in and regulate your life. It's just an excuse for more government control of your life, and I've never been for any scheme or even accepted the junk science behind the whole narrative of global warming. This came up over and over and over again. In the Republican Party, there were four things that you could not be in favor of. One was control of guns. One was abortion rights for women. One was accepting homosexuality. And the fourth one now is accepting the science of global warming. These became the four planks in the Republican. These were, these were things you could not even discuss without being dismissed by the right wing of that party. And the right wing was in control. The Tea Party end was in control. So here's um, Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan, you may remember, actually became the vice presidential candidate selected by Mitt Romney for the Republican Party. Scientists have tried to intentionally mislead the public. There remains a lack of scientific consensus on the issue, on the extent of the warming, the extent of the human contribution, and the severity of the risk. So that's his perspective. And then finally, Rick Perry, who was such a prominent candidate, he made it to the front page of the Time magazine. Global warming is flat out hogwash, he said. And this is, this is the real irony of it. When politics hijacks science, he said, it quells true scientific debate and can have dire consequences for our future. I think he got that a little bit backwards there. And just, just to give you some insight here, while he was running for president, the Texas uh, Department of Environmental Protection produced a report about how to deal with uh, coastal erosion. And uh, Perry quashed the report. He stopped it being published because it talked about sea level rise. And of course, sea level rise is not happening because global warming is not happening because Rick Perry knows that. So that's what happened. Now, if we turn to the US Congress, there are a number of people in the Congress who are really embedded in the whole narrative of denying global warming. Most prominently, James Inhofe, who's a Republican from, uh, oh, I, I must have misspelt that, sorry, <laughs> Oklahoma. And he says, the threat of catastrophic global warming is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. It's an article of religious faith, he says. This is another narrative that you see. And he, he thinks that global warming's actually ceased already. He's so confident that he's right that he called for the indictment of 17 climate scientists for um, violating several acts, and he listed them here, the Freedom of Information Act, these various things. The logic was these scientists have violated federal law because they received federal funding for their research. 
And in the course of that research, they found that global warming was happening and that global warming was related to human activity. I know, I, James Inhofe, know that global warming is not happening. Therefore, these people have committed fraud by using taxpayer money to defraud the government. That's the, that's the obtuse logic that he is. And I'm happy to say I was one of these 17 that he asked for. <laughs> and I was in very good company, I must say. I was, I, when I looked at the other 16, I was quite proud to be amongst that list. Um, now let's look a little bit more at the science. This is a little bit washed out, but um, it doesn't matter where we go on the planet, whether we go to Alert here on Northern Ellesmere Island, we go to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, or we go right down to the South Pole, wherever we measure the background level of trace gases, whether it's carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, all of these are greenhouse gases, we see a rising pattern. Even at the South Pole, where clearly there's, in the Southern Hemisphere, and certainly in Antarctica, there's very little um, fossil fuel being used. Uh, but we see this trend that is repeated. And we also see superimposed on that trend this cycle, this annual cycle, which, and this is related to the greening of the biosphere in the spring, and believe me, I know you live in Quebec, but spring is coming. It will be here soon. Um, the trees will leaf up, and uh, you'll forget about all that snow. But as that happens, the atmosphere, the, the CO2 is drawn out of the atmosphere. You all know this. And it's fixed through photosynthesis. And, um, and, and so the CO2 levels are lowered in the summer, and then they rise back up again in the fall. And this continues. And this, I think it's important to, to to, to note that because this reminds us that the CO2 that we're now burning was actually the same process occurred hundreds of millions of years ago when CO2 was taken out of the atmosphere, fixed by plants, eaten by animals, and that material was then, through geological processes, uh, turned into coal and natural gas and oil that we're now burning. And we're doing it at a much, much faster rate than it took for the atmosphere, to, for that material to be taken out of the atmosphere in the first place. And of course, these gases are important because they are so-called greenhouse gases. They're, they're radiatively active gases. They are transparent to incoming shortwave radiation, but they're opaque to the longer wave radiation that is emitted by the Earth. And so the net effect of this is to raise the Earth's temperature. We've always had greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but we're enhancing or adding to the concentrations, and that is creating this um, so-called greenhouse effect where the, the additional energy is trapped in the, in the troposphere. So if we look at the record of, of temperature, this is global temperature since 1880, and then in the background here, we see the measured measurements of carbon dioxide that have taken place over this interval of time. So we've gone from somewhere around 280 parts per million by volume for CO2 in pre-industrial times, 280, and we're now in 2013 almost at 400 parts per million in the, in the background. How do we know this is related to the global warming? We can run computer models. This is that temperature record that I showed you the black line. Um, we can run simulations, model simulations, to, with the, the natural forcings unrelated to human activity. Those principally, on this time scale, the principal forcings are variations in solar irradiance and changes in volcanism, explosive volcanism that put, puts material into the atmosphere. When we run those simulations, we can see that at the beginning of the century, they sort of track the individual changes in temperature. But as we get into the later part of the century, the, the last century from 1950 or 60 on, we cannot, we cannot reproduce the observed record of temperature based on the natural 
record the natural forcing of climate. But if we add, if we run exactly the same model with solar and with volcanic activity and we now add greenhouse gases, we get this simulation. And so you can see that the, the, the record of observed temperature is really very well explained when we supplement the observed natural variability with the anthropogenic activity due to greenhouse gases. And there are many other, this is a very simple demonstration, there are many other fingerprints that we can look at, both the geographical distribution of change, the vertical distribution in the atmosphere, and so on. We can look at many different fingerprints. If we were detectives, we would find the, the culprit of the changes, and it's the greenhouse gases. And of course, there are many consequences for those changes. You are very familiar with this here. This is the, the changes in, in uh, ice cover over the Arctic Ocean, 1979 to 2011. And of course, it was even less in the last couple of years. And here we have the ice volume. So this is this is both area and thickness, and it's been steadily declining. This, this graph goes back to 1978, and we're now at all-time lows. And of course, there's some sort of feedback associated with this as the ice gets thinner. Uh, it gets relatively easy to get rid of it every year. We always see this sort of discussion in the press, but what we don't often see is the fact that this is also happening all over the globe, even at the equator. This is Cotopaxi in Ecuador, right on the equator. It's an ice cap volcano that goes up almost to 6,000 meters. <coughs> the red here, <coughs> looks, looking down, shows the extent of glacier ice in 1976, and in blue in 1997. And you can see there's been a steady shrinkage. If we updated this to 2013, it would be even smaller. The same thing is happening in Peru, in, in Bolivia, in Peru, in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Venezuela. It's happening in Africa. There are almost no ice left in Africa now, two tiny little ice masses on Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya. The last vestige of ice in Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea is almost gone. So this is happening everywhere. It's, an, it's a global phenomenon. There's very few glaciers or ice caps that are actually uh, growing. And of course, all that material is ending up in the ocean, and that's causing sea level to rise. And I, w I won't get into that now, but the projection is that sea level will be about a meter higher by the end of the century, globally. Now, let's just uh, take a minute to look forward in time and of course, we don't know, this, this goes from 2000 here, or 1990 to 2100. And here on this axis are emissions, CO2 emissions. And um, this is a bit washed out, but in a few years ago, we were producing about 8.5 billion metric tons, and we're now up to almost 10, 10 billion here. 1992, it was down about 5 billion per year. Now, where will these emissions go in the future? Well, we don't know. We don't know how many nuclear power plants there will be. We don't know how many coal-fired plants. We don't know how many people will be driving Priuses or Hummers or, or everything in between. Uh, we don't know how many, uh, how many people there will be on the planet, which is probably the most important variable. Uh, the UN projects that there'll be about nine to ten billion people by the middle of the century. Where there's now seven billion people on the planet. So what the IPCC did in the last assessment was they took a range of scenarios. They said, okay, we don't know what the future will bring, but let's take a set of scenarios. One would be the sort of business as usual. Nobody, nobody pays any attention. We keep on burning coal. We keep on churning out um, fossil fuel emissions or carbon emissions from fossil fuel. Uh, that would be the sort of worst case scenario. And then there's a number of in intermediate cases. I'll, I'll draw your attention to this one, A1B, which I'll come back to in a minute, in the middle here. And then there's the sort of optimistic scenario that the emissions will peak with the population and that 
that we will actually draw down emissions below where they are today by the end of the century. So we don't know what the scenarios are, but this, this, we could take the extreme options. And by the way, since this graph was produced, we've, we've actually followed the higher scenario here, not the lowest scenario. So we're, we're on this trajectory, not this one. But even so, what would the CO2 levels be with this range of scenarios? And here's the alarming thing. If we followed this path, by the end of the century, the CO2 would be almost 1,000 parts per million. Now, I should point out that at 400 parts per million, we are already, for CO2, we already have higher levels of CO2 than, the, than, has been, uh, than we have any evidence for going back around three to four million years. If we go to this level, we'd be talking uh, tens of millions of years, probably. But even if we lower our emissions below where they are today, remember we're about here today, even if we lower them by the end of the century, we still end up with CO2 at 550 parts per million. Why is that? It's because the processes by which CO2 is removed from the atmosphere are much slower operate on a much slower time scale than the rate at which we're pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. So it takes a long time for the CO2 to be drawn down. Right now, half of the CO2 is absorbed by the oceans. And that process may eventually slow up. And uh, we're also deforesting large parts of the globe. And of course, that's a sink for CO2 as well. And as the oceans warm up, they release CO2. So all of these factors combine to show you that even if we're, we're good citizens and we begin to lower our emissions, uh, the, 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 the problem is it, we've got to do it much, much more rapidly. And this is why scientists are constantly um, harping on about this. Now, bear in mind that the EU, the European Union target for emissions reduction is 450 parts per million. Now, the, the argument there is that at 450 parts per million, global average temperature will be limited to two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level. So they're trying to keep the, 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 the warming to within two degrees C of um, the pre-industrial level. By the way, in the United States, this is completely meaningless because nobody knows what Celsius is. <laughs> so they have no idea what that means. 3.6 Fahrenheit, you have to translate that into. But anyway, the idea is they want to keep the emissions to 2 degrees C. Um, we're at 400 now. It's almost impossible to do that. And that is a global average. Two degrees C is global average. With, with the amplification at higher latitudes, that would translate to more like five or six degrees C in the Arctic. So it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an enormous problem if we can't limit emissions to the point where we're keeping them below 450 or even 550 at the most optimistic level. OK, now, let's. Um, what would those changes mean in terms of temperature? Now here, instead of looking at 100 years, we've gone back 1,000 years. And this is the reconstruction that we produced, that I'll talk about in a minute, the so-called hockey stick, which shows the record of temperature over the last 1,000 years as best we could estimate it, and then the, the recent warming. And then these lines here, which are, I'm afraid are a bit washed out, represent the projections Go back to this graph. These various scenarios of where temperature would be if we follow those different scenarios, from the most optimistic here to the most pessimistic up here. And so what you can conclude from this is regardless of which scenario we follow, which path we follow, the future is likely to be completely different, completely outside of the envelope of natural variability 
that we've experienced over the last thousand years. Now, I mentioned that these are global average temperatures, globally average, but there's a geographical pattern. As I, as I said, here's that A1B scenario comparing a simulation here or a, a set of simulations for the end of this century with the end of the last century. And you can see the pattern of warming is amplified, reaching six or seven degrees Celsius warmer in polar regions. There won't be any Arctic sea ice for most of the year under that situation. And of course, superimposed on this, there's going to be another 50% more people living on the planet, which is, a, which is a, a, an amazing dilemma. Five million new souls per month, five million new people per month are living on this planet. By the end of the century, there will be 500 million by the middle of the century, not the end of the century, 15 years from now, we add a billion people every 15 years. 15 years from now, there'll be 500 more million more people living in Africa and 500 million more people living in Asia because that's where most of the new people are. This is a major problem. And of course, although we focus a lot on global warming, we focus on temperature, the biggest changes, the, the most significant changes, are really going to be in the distribution of rainfall. And although we have more difficult problem in simulating precipitation patterns, if you just look at these two A1B scenarios, that's the middle of the road scenario for winter and summer, just look at the general pattern of browns and yellows versus blues. What you see here is increased rainfall largely at higher latitudes or increased snowfall in the winter. Sorry about that, Quebec, but that's the plan. Uh, but you see this expansion of the Hadley circulation so that the subtropics expand outward into what are now the mid-latitudes. So for example, here, basically North African conditions become more widespread into Southern Europe. And the same thing happens in Southern Africa and, and even in parts of South America. So the, dis the redistribution of rainfall patterns is likely to be a much more important and difficult problem to deal with, um, especially with this higher levels of people living on the planet than the temperature changes. So that comes back to this problem. The IPCC has, is the best assessment. I'm quite confident that the next assessment, which will be out next year, will come to very similar conclusions. This is not going away. It is a major problem. And it was acknowledged as such by the Nobel Peace Prize Committee when they awarded the IPCC the Nobel Peace Prize. This is Pachari, who was heading that particular IPCC assessment, and Al Gore, Vice President Al Gore, for his advocacy as a public spokesman to try and raise awareness for the issue. And I, I must say, Al Gore is a very well-informed individual, and he's, a, and he's a remarkable advocate, considering he didn't have to do any of this. He's a multimillionaire. He's reached his, the pinnacle of his political career. But he really believes this is a global problem that has to be dealt with. Now, let's just think about this for a minute. If you're opposed to the notion of global warming, and you're completely opposed to any government intervention in the marketplace, in controlling emissions, what is your worst nightmare? Your worst nightmare is that a very influential scientific report endorsed by all major scientific organizations comes out. And that is exactly what happened. The IPCC came out and it was considered to be a threat to all those who were determined to stop legislation. I'm talking now about the U.S. context. The interests of these politicians are largely financed by the energy industries and they support with, with a lot of money politicians who will 
get behind their objectives, and their objectives are to eliminate any possibility of controls on carbon. And also by these so-called market fundamentalists who are really philosophically opposed to any government intervention. And they're very rich. A lot of these people are exceptionally rich. They're multi-billionaires. So they have unlimited money at their disposal. And so what they, the strategy that they devised was to try to destroy the credibility of the IPCC reports by concentrating on the one image that came to represent that the public associated with the IPCC report. And that image was this, the hockey stick, so-called hockey stick, which was a paper that I published with my postdoc, Mike Mann, and my colleague, Malcolm Hughes, from the University of Arizona. And this was nothing more than an attempt to use paleoclimate information to put the recent changes in a longer context. It was a perfectly innocent or normal scientific exercise. The question was, how unusual is the recent warming? We don't have any instrumental data going back in time, so let's use proxy data, tree rings, ice cores, sediments, corals, and so on, that have a temperature um, signal in their structure to see if we can reproduce, see if we can reconstruct global temperature, or in this case, northern hemisphere temperature, over the last thousand years. And that's what we published. And the irony of it is, this was the title of the paper, Northern Hemisphere Temperatures During the Past Millennium, Inferences, Uncertainties, and Limitations. The focus was on the fact that this was not an easy thing to do, and there was a lot of uncertainty, and it was a working hypothesis. We put it out there. This was published in, first in Nature and then in GRL. We put it out there, let people have a go at it, see if they can improve on it, and so on. That was the way we looked at it. But it was included in the last IPCC report. And when they produced this report, it's 800 pages. It's huge volumes. So in order to make it more digestible, they produce an executive summary, which is about 20 pages, hoping that some executive somewhere will actually read it. Not very likely. Certainly no politician. But then they had a press conference. And they're summarizing the IPCC, this 800-page report. And as you maybe you can't see in the background here, this is Sir John Horton. But in the background here is the picture of the hockey stick. This was part of the press conference. And so the hockey stick was very digestible to people. After all, it's simple. Temperatures were going down, and then they started going up. And this is when greenhouse gases really took hold, and the public was able to grasp that. So it became an image that captured, in the public's mind, this issue of global warming, rightly or wrongly. I'm not going to say it's, <laughs> it's the right thing to capture that image, but that's what happened. It became reproduced in Time magazine, in the New York Times. It was in all the major newspapers. Everybody had this image in their mind. And so it became this icon of the IPCC report. So the question that these politicians ask themselves is, how can we make this report not believable anymore? And by the way, if the, if the hockey stick had never appeared in the IPCC report, it would have had no impact whatsoever on the fundamental arguments, the fundamental physics of the problem. It was irrelevant to the issue, but never mind. So what happened was these two guys, Joe Barton, who was a Republican from Texas, chairman of the House Energy Committee, and this guy, Ed Whitfield from Kentucky, rather alarmingly chairman of this committee called Oversight and Investigations, wrote letters to me and to Malcolm Hughes and Mike Mann, and also to the head of the National Science Foundation and Pachari, who was head of IPCC. And they demanded a whole range of materials. They wanted from me every record of every payment I'd ever received in my career, every honorarium, 
all the money that I'm going to get from the INRS for coming here, <laughs> um, book royalties, you know, everything. Every email inquiry that I'd ever had asking for data, how I responded to those inquiries, and so on, and a whole range of other questions, including some very arcane statistical questions that these guys wouldn't have a clue how to respond to. Um, and the same thing went to the other members of the, 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 the study. So the idea was if they could make it appear that the hockey stick was wrong and, and somehow cast doubt on the credibility, the reputations of those people who were involved, it would reflect badly on the IPCC report. The, the goal was to create an atmosphere of doubt, an atmosphere of suspicion. This is straight out of the playbook of the tobacco industry where they did the same thing. When there, was, there were arguments that nicotine was bad for you, the tobacco industry went after the scientists to try to cast doubt. There's a famous memo that came to light called, Doubt is Our Product where they, that was what they were trying to do. And Naomi Oreskes wrote a great book about this recently. So if the science is questionable and the scientists are a bunch of phonies, why would you support legislation to control greenhouse gases? So they launched a congressional inquiry focused on the hockey stick. This was the first time this had ever happened uh, where a, a congressional committee demanded information about a single scientific article published in a peer-reviewed journal. They demanded all of this material, not just about the period when I was working on the hockey stick, or Mike Mann was, but over my entire career, which, as you can tell, goes back many, 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 many decades. So what was the result of that? What did the news, newspapers and TV, how did they respond? Well. They came up with something like this. Scientists accused of fraud, doubts cast on international report. That was the headline they wanted. They didn't care about the hockey stick. They didn't care about the statistics. They, 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 they didn't even understand how we compiled that. Their goal was to get the headline, to create a smell in the room. Makes people quickly flicking through the newspaper just see the headline hear it on the radio, hear it on TV. And the media absolutely played along. They just loved this idea of controversy. So the media were complicit in this whole effort. Where this would have gone, I don't know. I was, when you have a government body like this bearing down on you, it's very intimidating. You don't know where it will end. They could ruin you financially because you would have to get a lawyer to defend yourself and so on. It's really quite alarming. It's, a, it's what um, Soros called soft fascism, using the power of the state to intimidate individual people. This guy saved our bacon, also a Republican from New York. And if it wasn't for Sherwood Bullitt, I don't know what would have happened. There aren't very many principled politicians left in Washington, but he, he was one. Unfortunately, he retired <laughs> almost immediately after this, but, but I've never met him, but I dedicated my little book to him because I, I really felt that he stood up for us. And he, he was chairman of the House Science Committee. Joe Barton, remember, was House, chairman of the House Energy Committee. And Bolet wrote to Barton and he said, these letters do not appear to be a serious attempt to understand global warming. Some might interpret them as a transparent effort to bully and harass experts who have reached conclusions with which you disagree. The purpose of these letters seems to be to intimidate scientists rather than to learn from them and to substitute congressional review for scientific peer, scientific peer review, which would be pernicious. This was absolutely the way I felt about it, too. But he, in this era, this was the Bush era, just like you have the Harper era now, everybody walks in lockstep. Nobody disagrees with the party line. So suddenly you had two prominent 
Republicans disagreeing with each other publicly. He went on to say, one has to conclude there's no legitimate reason for your investigation. You don't need it to get the data or to understand the issues. The only conceivable explanation is to intimidate a prominent scientist and to have Congress put its thumbs on the scales of a scientific debate. When it comes to scientific debates, Congress is all thumbs. <laughs> and I said in my book that this, uh, this should be engraved on the headstone of every scientific building in the United States. When it comes to scientific debates, Congress is all thumbs. Leave it to the scientific community through peer review to decide whether the hockey stick lives or dies. It's nothing to do with Congress. They can't evaluate that. Fortunately, this, the press now responded to this. Suddenly there were these two prominent Republicans arguing about this and they came down on our side. And they said, what is all this about? Why are these guys going after these scientists? And editorials appeared all over the country. New York Times, Washington Post. This is the one I like best. It was called an attack, attack on sound science. Um, and it goes on to say, centuries ago when the Inquisition forced Galileo to renounce his work that proved the earth revolves around the sun, legend has it that Galileo muttered, nevertheless it moves. Today Barton might force climate scientists to offer, utter, nevertheless it's getting warmer. <laughs> so it was very flattering to be compared to Galileo in this book. Anyway, um, this eventually led to uh, this whole issue subsiding. Joe Barton went his own way, he had his own inquiry and I won't get into all of that now. But I want to just point out that this is not exactly new in the United States and elsewhere. The first person who was um, uh, vilified was Ben Santer, who is now a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a very distinguished climate modeler. He was involved in an earlier IPCC report. And they went after Ben. They published articles in the Wall Street Journal um, right-wing politicians wrote articles saying that Ben had manipulated and altered the IPCC report, none of which was true. But the same thing happened. The public, the, the articles that were written were headlined, scientists manipulate report, doubts cast on report. The same thing, to try to create in the mind of the, in the, mind of the public doubts about the credibility of this. Um, so destroy the message by destroying the messenger, that was it. And, and, and Ben was really badly affected. He had death threats. He had people, uh, uh, he had to have a, an armed guard on his house. It was really horrible. Later on, Climate Gate, the so-called Climate Gate, that the press loves this, you know, something gate. They have to have something gate. Um, Phil Jones, good colleague of mine from East Anglia, I've worked with him for decades. Uh, a whole bunch of emails were stolen and um, published on the web and of course this created a whole furor in the press. They went through it looking for any kind of sentence or two that looked weird. Um, I turned on the CNN one night, there was a close-up of an email. Dear Ray, I thought, oh my God, now what's this, what's this going on here? So, you know, this was a, this was a CNN had a, two one-hour specials, two one-hour specials on climate gate. What is this? It's just ridiculous. They're just obsessed with this idea that there's a controversy going on. Later on, when people calmed down a bit, Associated Press did an analysis of the emails. There were a million words in, in total. And out of that, they found two sentences that were clearly suspicious, talking about a trick and something else. Um, but again, it led to the general public to think that something was going on, that scientists were manipulating this. So it, it, was, it achieved the same goal. And the media were complicit in promoting this idea that there was something going on here. Um, so what was the result of these lies? 
campaigns of lies. Many in the U.S. no longer rate global warming as very important. The public think that scientists don't even agree with each other, that they, they, they haven't come to a firm conclusion, that there's something phony going on. And so there's very little consensus on what to do about the problem. And this whole issue of carbon taxes or limiting emissions is really a, a very hard thing to get through Congress. So in effect, the energy industries and their right-wing allies in, in, are winning, and um, they're, they're, they've not been able to put a cost on the price or, or to price the air pollution that we all suffer from. We have a very good scientific understanding of the problem. We have a lot of technological and economic remedies that could be applied to the problem. The difficulty is we have a vacuum of leadership at the political level. That's where the problem lies. Scientifically, we know what the problem is. Technologically, we have many solutions. What's missing is somebody to take charge and to really make things happen. And even worse, in many countries, extremism has taken hold. Just last week, in the United States, again, the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee has named this Republican from, Oak, from uh, Utah. He's a climate science denier. He's now the new chairman of the subcommittee responsible for climate change issues. These guys are like the, the um, no, they just don't go away. He's unconvinced that anthropogenic global warming is based on sound science. And this phrase, sound science, has been co-opted by the right wing. Sound science. That means science that supports what I think is happening, not objective science. Mitt Romney, this was his statement. I'm not willing to adopt multi-trillion dollar programs. I don't know where this comes from, to reduce greenhouse gases. They don't call it America warming. They call it global warming. Let those guys fix the problem. So this is the, this is the real difficulty. On a, on a national level, in a country like the United States, it's very hard. But it's even harder if the national debate, it's even hard to get international agreement if the national debate is not there. And here's, here's the summary of what's, what's going on. This is the view from the US Congress. So here's, here we have carbon emissions. This is in gigatons of CO2. And they look at this. They pick any one year. This is 2007. And they say, well, look at all that stuff that China's producing. We're not going to do anything until China reduces their emissions. That's the problem. China is the problem. And then we go to China, and they look at the emissions over the post-industrial period, the last 200 years. And they say, well, Look who's responsible for all the emissions. It's the U.S. and the EU. We, don't, we haven't produced much at all over that period. And of course, this is the correct view, actually. because It's the cumulative emissions that count. And then we go to India, and they say, well, look, we hardly produce anything at all. If you look at it on a per capita basis, per person. So we're not going to do anything until you reduce your emissions as individuals. So we've got these three different perspectives on the same fundamental problem. And it's kind of like this. This is the picture I like to imagine. There's a wall covered in graffiti. And this stretches back in time or stretches back in space. It's covered in graffiti. And then right at the very end, there's a couple of Chinese characters and a few bits of Sanskrit. And we say, hey, guys, let's go clean up this wall. This is a mess. We need to clean it all up. And China says, well, we'll clean up this bit. But you have to clean that up. You did all that. And, and we say, no, we, everybody has to clean up this mess. So this is a fundamental um, difficulty of getting everybody on board. And of course, there are lots of ways we can, we can improve the situation. There's lots of technology out there. I won't get into the, these different things. But it's certainly true that other countries have recognized the problem and have taken strong measures to limit emissions, led by the European countries, especially Germany. I was, uh, I was in Bremen recently visiting Bernzalichka, and we drove from Bremen to Bremerhaven, 
It's about the same distance as from Amherst to Boston on the Massachusetts Turnpike. And I counted 220 windmills on either side of the highway as I was going north. Uh, we don't have any hardly in Massachusetts, and probably the same in, in most of New England. Um, so we, we have plenty of options. We can reduce waste, we can reduce energy consumption, but many have been persuaded that um, regulation reduces employment. In fact, there are hopeful signs. This is the recent report from the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna. It says that by 2050, renewables could represent over half of the global energy supply, half of the world's new electric capacity over the last couple of years was renewable. Majority of it in developing countries. In 2010, renewable capacity additions overtook nuclear power's total installed capacity. So things are happening around the world. In the European Union, electric capacity additions have been 40% renewables each year. And in Denmark, 30% of the electricity in 2010 was renewable. And, and China is also investing heavily in renewables. So this is one solution. I'm not saying it's the only solution. But it, the, the, clearly there are technologies out there that we can be dealing with. So there are solutions. They're being adopted in many countries and in various states in the United States, despite the impotence and the extremism that is being shown by the federal government, both here and in the United States. Our challenge as citizens, not just as scientists, but as citizens, is we, we must confront these political leaders and demand they address these problems. When somebody is appointed to be chairman of the science committee who says global warming does not happen, is not existing, we have to confront those individuals and demand that they explain what scientific evidence they have that the rest of us don't have. What is it that you know about this problem that we don't? We have to do that because we must build a more sustainable, more equitable global society Remember, the population is growing, 7 billion, it'll be 9 or 10 billion. And uh, I think it's important to remember on this day in particular, this phrase. Martin Luther King was assassinated, I think it was 45 years ago today. And there's a wonderful f speech he gave in Washington. It's called the I Have a Dream speech, where he talked about his... Um, his hopes and his aspirations for the, of course he was talking about civil rights. But in that speech, he talks about the fierce urgency of now. And he makes the point that this is an urgent problem. It's not going away. We cannot wait. We cannot postpone action. And it's the same. There are billions of people around the planet who are poor as church mice and they are suffering and we cannot allow these environmental problems to continue because they're only going to get worse. There is this fierce urgency of now. And so I'll finish here. I wrote about this in this little book. You can, you can even buy it on Kindle now on Amazon. If you're interested in learning more about my experiences, you might get a copy of this. Perhaps it's in your library. So with that, I'll stop and thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Raymond Bradley. Euh, maintenant, euh, est-ce qu'il y aurait des questions, probablement? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry I didn't make it. 
were written by what? No, that's not the case. Well, of course, uh, yes, in terms of their yeah co-authors and so on, that's probably true. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's certainly true that there is there are tremendous opportunities still in science. I mean, I remember when I was a graduate student thinking that everything was already figured out. And it was a kind of a depressing thought that, you know, how could I ever make any kind of dent in the scientific fabric? Um, but new opportunities come up all the time, new new instruments, new ways of looking at new data sets and so on, and that's a very exciting time to be involved in science, so that's the first thing I would say. Um, and as I tried to get across here, the issues that we're dealing with, the environmental issues, are really very, very important, not just to us, but to people who don't even know what the word science means. There are millions of people living in poverty around the world. I think there's four billion people, four billion people, so let's say more than half of the world who earn less than you and I would spend on a cup of coffee a day. And those people can't wait for things to change. They're not the ones who are creating the the carbon emissions. They're not the ones who are changing the climate of the planet. And yet mu much of the impact of climate change will be felt by those communities, by those people. And so I think we all have a responsibility to do the best science we can to address many of these issues. Of course, they're not, we're not all working on global issues like this, but there are many environmental issues that are equally pressing and equally important. And I also think it's important that we, as scientists, um, reach out to the public, to the general public, to make sure that they understand the importance of science and the credibility of science. Uh, there, is a, there is quite a disconnect because we often just focus on publishing in scientific journals, in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, we also must try to reach out to other outlets, um, perhaps that we're not used to. Um, magazines, Ch talk to church groups, talk to libraries, go out and, and write articles, write um, little vignettes that can be published in newspapers. We have to be, we have to recognize that, that there's a vast population out there and they need to understand these issues better because if if the public understands them better it will mean that these politicians cannot get away with the kinds of activities that they get away with when, when they can easily pull the wool over people's eyes. Well, you could be almost sure that many of these people who think that global warming's not happening don't believe in evolution either. So they probably, <laughs> they probably, uh, you know, haven't evolved very much themselves. That's part of the problem. Um, l I mean, let's face it. You often see things. You often see signs that say 
save the climate. We're not going to save anything. You can't save the climate. The climate will change. It has changed in the past, as climate skeptics often point out. It will change in the future. It will, but, but in the past there weren't seven billion people trying to survive on this planet, or ten billion in the future. So it's a completely different story. Yes, climate will change and people will have to deal with it, will have to adapt to it, and a lot of people will not be able to adapt to it. That's the fundamental problem. They don't have the resources to adapt to it. There's 120 million people live within one meter of current sea level. They will have to move. Uh, there'll be more extreme weather events that will impact people. So people will suffer from these changes. And most of us in our Western societies are insulated from those changes. We, we may suffer from more extreme storms, but we have insurance. You know, we'll get over it. There are lots of people out there, if they don't have food that they can grow, then they, they don't eat. So that's a different side of the coin that we often don't think about. Um, as to the tar sands, well, it's, it's hard for me to address that because fundamentally we should be trying to reduce the amount of fossil fuel that we use on all levels, whether it's coming from the tar sands or from uh, fracking uh, natural gas in the United States or from, um, from oil in Nigeria or anywhere else. And we can. It's, it's not rocket science that we can reduce our consumption probably 30 to 40 percent without any significant impact on our way of life by making energy engines, car engines more efficient, by having more insulation in our homes, by doing pretty simple things. And that's clear. We can, we can do that. But there's always going to be this residual problem until we get to some future state, which might be decades away, where we're more or less relying on 100% on renewables. So what should we do? Should we continue to consume the resources that we have? Uh, or should we develop new resources such as the tar sands? The tar sands, as I understand it, are exceptionally energy inefficient in a sense, that the, you, you almost have to use as much energy to, to extract the material as you get out of it. So uh, I, I think that it doesn't make sense to encourage the development of those kind of resources. Incidentally, if I could just show you one, one slide, which I think I brought with me, it's just kind of an interesting way of looking at this. This is, this is put out by a group called the Carbon Project. What this shows is, um, this is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, in a sort of volumetric sense, up to the pre-industrial level, 1750. This is how much we've added to the atmosphere since 1750. And this is the sort of what's left if we're going to limit our global temperature to two degrees C, this is the EU target. So we've, we've sort of used up, if you like, most of our opportunity to, to limit global warming to two degrees C. We're closely approaching that limit. Up here are all of the declared reserves of oil in existing reservoirs, oil and, and natural gas and coal and so on. And what that, what that shows you is this is, this, these resources are almost unusable because the, the environmental consequences of using those resources would be totally catastrophic globally. So in that sense, the valuation on many of our major companies like Exxon and Shell and BP, the valuation of those companies is based on their assets. And where are their assets? Their assets are in the ground now. So when somebody values that company, they say, well, they have all these reserves. But those reserves are unused, and they are, to a large extent, unusable. And I think that message has to be, be, be made more visible. These companies are overvalued because their assets are essentially unusable, and it's the same with the tar sands.
we don't we can't use what we've got already why do we need to develop more other than to prop up the Alberta government and the and the Harper government too Well, I mean, it's, it, it comes down to public advocacy. There are denialist machines and they have resources, but we have resources too, we have individuals. Uh, we should be writing to the newspapers. As I mentioned to you, I, I will draft a letter to the Global Mail this weekend about the suppression of government um, uh, scientists in, in Canada. Uh, which is exactly what happened in the Bush administration. If you don't toe the line, uh, you're not allowed to speak out. Um, and, and people have got to say that's not acceptable. And I know there's an inquiry that's been launched, um, or a public commission, I think, has been launched in Canada to look into this. But the, the, it's up to each of us to write. What, what are the, how do we reach our fellow citizens? There are little local newspapers, there's radio shows, call-in shows. You know, and, and there are politicians who have telephones and emails. And we've all got to make it clear that this activity is not acceptable. And, and unfortunately, most people are not motivated to do that. And I have to admit, you know, until this happened to me, I wasn't so motivated either. But now I see it so clearly, what's happening. And um, I'm damned if I'm going to let these people get away with it. So I'm. They got my back up now, and I'm willing to stand up and speak out about it. But we all have to do that. We can't just be passive about this. So I would encourage you to, um, you know, call up your local politicians and write letters to the editor and do everything you can think of to get the the message out that this is not what you expect of your government. So. <coughs> 
I agree. I, I agree, and in, it's it's interesting that in the United States, very often the right wing and the religious right are on the same page. So we often think of the right wing as fundamentalist or uh, evangel evangelical, but um, there are many religious groups in the United States now who are taking a strong stand on the issue of global warming for precisely the reasons that you raise. They're, these are moral issues. And so they're, they're saying that we have a responsibility to preserve the creation that we inherited, that we were given to work with, so to speak. And, um, and so I think there are uh, religious groups that we should be working with as scientists to try to get that moral hazard uh, front and center. And I think the, I'm not a Catholic, but I, I think the new pope, I would, I would love to have the chance to sit and talk to him because I think he's a guy who would really get it and uh, would have a pulpit, so to speak, <laughs> um, where he could make the, the point to a lot of people all at once. And I think we will hear from him on these issues. I think he's the kind of guy who will um, speak out on these issues. Why did I? But well. I, I could have framed it in that sense. I, I, I mean, I do think it is a moral and ethical issue. I, I just gave a talk uh, last week in Switzerland where I addressed that very, I, I, the, the theme of my talk was exactly that, that we have a moral and an ethical responsibility to um, not only to this growing population of people, but also to the, um, the rest of nature, so to speak that we are depleting. I mean, I think one of the, 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 the biggest issues we have, quite apart from global warming, is the loss of species. The, 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 the you know, extinction is forever. And um, there, there are many natural environments that we're destroying at a phenomenal rate in order to grow soybeans so we can have more McDonald's hamburgers or, or um, you know, f farming in the ocean and destroying marine resources too. So I think there's, there's many different levels of moral hazard that we're facing. And I think the, when I talk about global warming, I'm just talking about one of those global impacts. It happens to be an impact on the atmosphere. But we're having an enormous impact on the marine environment through ocean acidification from using marine resources on deforestation and loss of species uh, on, on many different levels. And I think it all comes down to our collective responsibilities as society and our individual responsibilities to help that society move in the right direction. So I do think it, I agree with you 100% that this is an ethical issue and we can, we can approach it from a scientific pro point of view. But the big problem we face in almost every situation is the politics of it. It's the politics that gets in the way of the solutions. And that's why we have to engage, unfortunately, in the political realm. Um, and I'll just give you one last example. I testified in the Senate in the US, and you know I took it as a responsibility to present the scientific case for global warming, why it was urgent, and so on. And I think I did a good job. But immediately, the senators said to me, okay, so what are we gonna do about it? What should we do about it? That, that moves me into a totally different situation. I'm not an economist. I can't say, well, we should impose a carbon tax or 
cap and trade is better than a carbon tax. I don't, I can't, I don't have the credentials to weigh up the relative merits. I, I have my own personal opinion on that. Um, I don't know what the technological solutions are, whether it's better to have more solar panels or more wind and so on. So the solutions, it's a complex problem. It's not just a scientific issue. It needs everybody to come together to grapple with these issues. But the very first starting point is to accept that it's a problem, not to deny it's a problem. Thank you.